thank you. Okay, Diagnostics 4.0. I would only like to, we have heard a lot of things today, very important uh, um, data and, and concepts uh, from the very beginning, I think. So I just put a couple of things together that I think may give an additional aspect, uh, one or another, and um, it's called Diagnostics 4.0, although you probably will ask the question what happened to Diagnostics 1.0 and 2.0 and 3.0. Actually, they don't exist. I made this up, this name, because uh, for reasons that I'm just going to show you. Um, so what I would like to talk to you about is um, a point that uh, re addresses the industrial revolutions one <coughs> through four. So because I believe that we can learn a lot of uh, uh, for the for the for the medicine and for the diagnostics from the industrial revolutions, particularly and uh, particularly of the fourth one, which has been around for quite some time now, but we are only embarking on this type of thing. Then uh, show a couple of disruptive elements. I would like to talk, address a little bit the Internet of Things because that is one of, in my opinion, and that would be open to discussion, of course, uh, the major driver that uh, will take, uh, generate data and put it somewhere for others to, to assess them and, and, and be combined with laboratory results, for example. And we have seen some of these things from, from Larry's presentation this morning that who ha where, he, where he basically put all kinds of models and concepts there. Anyway, so uh, I don't know whether you recognize this. Um, uh, doesn't have to do that uh, with the fact that the, uh, the, the conference has a song title. Now it's another song title. So um, I was always intrigued by this uh, text uh, lyrics by the Beatles when they say you want to ha uh, have a revolution. But uh, that, that's, all, that's all okay, but you don't want to have any destruction. And that's obviously not the case with um, the uh, industrial uh, uh, revolutions. And you know perfectly well that the first industrial revolution was the invention of the steam machine where power was ba basically transmitted using belts in a straight way. So just generating large machines, they could not be transferred, but it uh, destroyed uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, worker, working places and jobs. And um, with the second, um, with the second uh, industrial revolution, we had mass production assembly lines. Uh, electricity was the was the major disruptive element here because it allowed to to miniaturize uh, installations, machines, and transfer them, and not having them directly connected to the source of power uh, for the downstream function. And um, since the 1970s, I think we are in the area of uh, the third uh, industrial revolution where a computer came up and automation has been done. And this is basically where most of we, of, of, of the industry and of course also our profession and others are standing. And at the moment, and since several years now, we're talking about the integration of automation and cyber networks together with the physical world in a fourth, what we call fourth generation digitalization age and era. And obviously, it's the most interesting thing to, to see what's going on here and what will be the implications for us to do this. And I was quite amazed because I thought industry 4.0 is a really nice term. Then I found out that um, it was actually invented by some Germans. And I thought, Jesus, now they invented it, but we are so far behind, in, 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 at least in medicine. That's uh, for sure. <clears throat> anyway. So if you, if you look at the, the third, um, at the stage where you basically at, if, where, you, if, where you produce things, it's usually it's not flexible. Uh, there is some flexibility to it, and that's the same for, for medicine. There's less flexibility than we want, and we are being confronted with now our, cons our customers, the patients that are trying to be much more flexible with their, with their uh, access to health care technologies, to apps, and so on and so on. So this leaves it basically um, that uh, we need to address to be more flexible. And so uh, this is obviously not uh, be, uh, the case at the moment. If you look at this, um, here is basically in the fourth uh, industrial re uh, revolution. It's basically merging the physical world with cyber networks to allow in real time the information flow and use the insights from that information flow instantaneously. That's basically the promise of, of all this. <clears throat> 
And if you look at uh, the, the disruptive technologies that are behind this revolu revolution, the, a number of them can be uh, identified. And I remember that Larry this morning also had basically the same list, just uh, very similar. And uh, they are in, in economy and industry are obviously not exactly what we have in medicine, but you can identify things, uh, disruptive elements that uh, are relevant to medicine, of course. Um, uh, and uh, this brings me to, basically, this brings me to the question of the Internet of Things, which I would like to uh, talk a little bit about, because I think uh, that is interesting to, to discuss. The Internet of Things, where basically the devices communicate amongst each other. So it's very clear that in the future, the Internet of Things will be the Internet that has the most uh, data transfer and volume. Um, and you probably know uh, that this is the case, um, and the Internet of Things is something that is uh, extremely uh, rapidly growing, and it's basically completely out of uh, human interference. Um, and uh, that is, uh, of course, something that has been originally done in, 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 in shown in, in these very, very simple cartoons for the public um, uh, you know, to, to bring across the, the, the benefits and the promises of the Internet of Things. What most people don't know is the first Internet of Things device was a Coke machine in a, a computer de, a department where the students that were sitting in some offices far away from the single co uh, Coke machine device, vendor machine, and they, each time they went down there, the Coke machine was empty or the Coke was uh, too, uh, too warm. And if you know the Americans, they don't like something that's warm Coke. So they, had, so they came up with a device that equipped this machine with sensors, temperature sensors, and also so they were able to, um, and they were able to see remotely over through their computers whether or not there was still enough Coke in the machine. So that's uh, allegedly the, the first um, Internet uh, of Things device. Uh, from 1982 and ever since this of course has um, has been evolving if you look at um, what actually is going on here you can see that internet uh, the IOT devices have been growing over the last years with an uh, average growth rate by 30 percent to be now approximately in the range of 8 billion devices that are in uh, in use and there is a projection that in uh, 2020, so not far away, at the end of this decade, so there would be probably 30 billion um, internet devices that com communicate amongst each other without you interfering. So it could be, could be your pacemaker, but it could also be your garage door opener or your valve and your radiator at home and, and these types of things. So basically people say that um, in developed countries, it's down here, uh, most people will possess between 1,000 and 5,000 devices. Uh, so we have a device cloud around us, and you think it's a lot of a big number, but if you really think about it, so many little devices that um, uh, are uh, Internet of Things devices. And the global market, of course, is very uh, important, and of course that's why, why this is growing so far and if, uh, fast. And if you look at uh, your IP protocols that you use to connect to the Internet, we use to the IP4, uh, V4 protocol, which only can accommodate, let's say, eight, uh, 4 billion addresses, but now we have the IPv6, which you see increasingly, and that's just because the Internet of Things will take up so many addresses. So that's really a huge uh, development. Interesting book for this, if you're interested in this, is a book by Jeremy Rifkin, who is a very ingenious mind. Um, uh, he has written this book, The Zero Marginal Cost Society, a favorite book, really nice, very important thing. So what does that mean for healthcare? In the European Union, the healthcare uh, takes, uh, gobbles up approximately 6 to 11 percent of the gross domestic product. And global healthcare, because we already heard that it will be increasing, but I think that's what I have found here is um, $2.1 trillion. And it has already been said uh, that much of it is wasted. So if you look at it, 10% basically is wasted uh, through inefficiencies, and half of this 10% is uh, being impacted by new technologies like IoT. And if you could save annual costs 
of uh, 100 billion dollars. These are projections that could be made. So if you save 1%, this will free a lot of money and that's why many um, are interested in um, uh, retaking this money back and do other things with this. So <clears throat> coming uh, to the question, uh, how does disruption in, in the, uh, from the industry re revolutions and digitalization uh, impact on healthcare. There is an interesting um, concept uh, published by Eric Topol that he's a guy who is an, a cardiologist by profession and uh, very uh, insightful and has written a number of books and he has written this book, The Creative Destruction of Medicine. He basically says that digitalization will destroy medicine in, or disrupt it at least. And, and uh, this is according the term creative destruction is according to the economist, the famous uh, Austrian economist uh, uh, Schumpeter. That's why I just wanted to bring this name up. Anyway, so if you if we look at um, a conventional way we, we practice medicine, uh, what, over the last 10 years we have had heard about personalized medicine. So it's personalized, it's preventive, and it's predictive, and it doesn't work. Because we all know we should not eat so much, we all know we should not drink so much, and we all know we should move and go with the bicycle rather than with the car, and, and nobody does it. And it has no impact, so to speak. And the reason why this is, is of course it's paternalistic medicine, and it's not being accepted by the patient. The patient is now today in a different position. It doesn't follow, the compliance is low, so three, P3 medicine doesn't work. So you have this situation here where the, the physician has all the information and the patient is just sitting there. This is uh, the normal situation, but it's changing rapidly because you have electronic health records here which symbolized by this little card. And so information goes back and forth. The patient is the sovereign of his data and he can get this data from uh, all kinds of places, and we have heard a lot about this, where these data come from. And not only uh, does he have this data now, he can share it, he can participate in a different way. So that's P4 medicine. I think that was a uh, term created by Leroy Hood from California, as far as I remember. And the patient also now is connected to the internet uh, as he's a peer-to-peer. -peer. So that's why uh, I call it P5 medicine, if you want. So there is a complete, um, yeah, the, the weights have shifted a lot. Be, uh, between the former and this model here. And it has been addressed already that we do not possess uh, structured data usually. I know that uh, it's very different in Europe. In Germany we are really very far behind, you have to say, because as Thomas Gansland said, um, there had been a medical, a biomedical um, information a first wave which failed in a way for, for several reasons and then it became very quiet and only now it's starting up. But look at the Scandinavian countries, they are far more ahead. So we are struggling with this but I think everybody can relate to the fact that we have this typical unstructured data, all these data go into uh, hard copy archives and they, and they are dumped in some uh, 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 basement and forgotten and only very very little of the information that's very valuable to the patient also and to the physician goes into um, uh, into the process of healthcare and of course there's a number of people who say well we scan it but this of course also does not help it because we need structured um, data and that's what um, I think Thomas Gansan showed how what are the different levels and, and aspects and how we can approach those. And he said, well, he talked about this Miracum, and this is the beginning of Miracum, it was eight university hospitals, now we are ten and in the process of negotiating with an eleventh. So this is from the very early one, and you see here Germany, and you see the, uh, by uh, the post zip codes, you see the, the patients that are in, uh, involved in Miracum or uh, registered in Miracum. And the interesting thing is, how can we access all these data? How can we make uh, use of this data? And this is uh, data that Thomas Gansland has um, generated during the uh, application phase of the Miracum, where we just asked the question, we cannot uh, pool the data or cannot get to the data from the hospitals. We have to export the an analysis tools to the local sites and then have it, the analysis done decentrally and then aggregate the data and, and and get them back. And this way, within, let's say, I think two weeks it was, or three weeks, we were able in Germany to uh, 
uh, compile the data of 18,000 colorectal cancer patients from these uh, eight Miracom sites uh, together with three uh, cooperating sites. So 18,000 um, uh, patients and from these 80,000 patients we could um, uh, deduct a number of interesting features and, and in, in a sunburst plot like here, surgery and chemo and radio uh, and, and, and certain ICD-10 codes. So this is the model that we are, uh, that we are using and we are proposing to use in, f in the future uh, to integrate and to extract data and um, to make sense of uh, uh, large studies. Okay, so, well, <coughs> I said Diagnostics 4.0, after I typed in very naively, I typed in Diagnostics 4.0, up comes the site uh, in Google. So, I, the people that know me, they say, of course, that's clear. You, you give this guy something to say, he always comes up with a car or something like this. And this is really not, I'm not making this up, this is really such that, uh, it's, it's a diagnostics, uh, the 4.0 is an industry standard now for the automotive industry and field and I think we already seen what Audi for example has been proposing uh, to do in the future. So basically <clears throat> what it is, and it's very comparable to what we have in healthcare. So if you look at the car, um, it has lots of computers. The car is being diagnosed locally, but now the, all the data are being uploaded to clouds where they are being accessed by various professions. Could be a manager, could be a, a consultant, could be a, a manufacturer or some, somebody who delivers parts for uh, this car and wants to know the, um, the, uh, the fate of his components that he contributed to, to the car. So very, very similar to what a medical uh, situation is with the patient. So basically you could replace the, 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 the term uh, uh, car with patient. It uh, works in most of the instances if you read through this paper, it's interesting. So we can learn from this. Okay, so for diagnostics, I think these three aspects are very important um, uh, as disruptive technologies in diagnostics. And just to give a few examples, what could be a diagnostics 4.0? And of course, we've heard al already that through the Internet of Things, data are being uploaded into clouds today, basically. Um, and this is being done by many, many different devices. The, the, the important thing is that this type of data is very simple data. So it's blood pressure, it's heart rate, it's skin conductivity and these types of things so far as we are talking. But we already heard from the talk by Albert Vandenberg what kind of things we can envision uh, in the future, uh, how they may be uh, used in, in different settings. But so far, for me, the important aspect is you monitor, you have two uh, levels here of medicine in the future and diagnostics. These are the, the monitoring of the healthy, uh, which can be done basically uh, like shown here, and it, the diagnosing of the disease, which, which is um, technically more sophisticated and usually would, we would think that it will, take care, uh, will be taken care of in a laboratory. So now, <coughs> So for the patient, and I just uh, talked to Sverre yesterday, but I hope I got this right now, um, and biological variation is something that would, in future diagnostics, contribute to the data volume, of course, because if we think about uh, laboratory dose diagnostics today, we think about reference ranges, but there are uh, scientific, scientific evidence that it's much better, in some instances at least, if you, if you look at biological variation within the same patient. So that means you need to compile for every patient his personal individual variation of fluctuation of a parameter, always under the precondition that everything is in homeostasis and equilibrium. But okay, so you probably will have to store this data in a cloud. So this probably be the case. So you have one parameter here, now you get this very clearly and nothing will happen. There will also be other data coming in, maybe from other areas like the omics data we've seen uh, also what Dr. Roca was uh, telling us, but also environmental data, uh, air pollution we have seen as, an, as, an, as, a, as, a, as a point. And then once the disease uh, starts, uh, the, and this will be monitored and either then goes to the cloud and then maybe uh, will be uh, alerted uh, to the patient by or to the healthy, so far healthy, that there is some imminent uh, clinical condition and whether or not he can 
then contact the physician. So this is basically something that we could envisage uh, how Diagnostics 4.0 would uh, work in the future in some way. And we will have a huge additional data that will come into this cloud. And this is just for one example, DNA characterization, disruptive leaps and sophistication in clients. As you can see here, you see molecular biology in the pre-sequencing era, there was always some steps and then uh, long times it was in clients where the technology improved and it got, got another quantum leap and then it improved again and so on. And you can see here from cloned DNA sequencing using Sanger or Gilbert method in the beginning, that was a leap comparably uh, quickly. There was Amplicon sequencing, now we have NGS sequencing by various technologies and we already have seen that you can have handheld disposable sequencing devices like the Nanopore Minion that is basically available uh, commercially and can sequence long, long reads of DNA, uh, thereby uh, eliminating, eliminating many of the problems that we have so far for molecular diagnostics. So what I'm saying here is if you, if you look at it on a timeline, and it's, it's such that the, the, the uh, disruptive technology changes uh, seem to happen in much quicker and quicker pace. And uh, you will, of course, not, uh, rec recognize this immediately. I had just this as an example. We did not talk about it, actually. So I just I thought it was a very nice example. And you have already talked about it. So be, oh, in, in essence, so basically you see that the disease interactome, so diseases uh, that uh, can be uh, then investigated in depth with different um, uh, genes and the interactions between the genes and the their, their defects and, and changes. And these types of data are the data that will come into this cloud as well. So at, at some point, obviously, uh, we have to um, accommodate all of those as well. <clears throat> and uh, still another aspect would be, um, we know from uh, immunological therapy that uh, people react differently to uh, uh, therapy, of course, like in this particular case to cancer, for example, and we know that uh, uh, SNP variation in targets uh, will change the response of the patient to a standardized drug dosage and so on, and we know this from pharmacogenomic um, uh, studies in the past, and already this morning we heard from Ron van Schaik's work in Rotterdam that they've gone so far as to provide um, uh, a little card uh, with the, the genotypes of the cytochrome P450s for patients. So this will also have to be uh, integrated. And then to make it uh, still one, add still, add still one more di uh, dimension to it, uh, if you talk about biological variation, that's an individual thing. If you talk about then uh, the biological variation of another person, that might be very different. And of course, our reference ranges, at, <coughs> as we are used to them, uh, they are basically defined as the uh, uh, for this situation here. And um, I think uh, if biological variation would be helpful for uh, most of the uh, uh, parameters or diagnostics in the future, this probably will um, <coughs> change the way and we will be much more specific and much more precise in um, interpreting data. And last thing is uh, basically, I just have an example for you. Um, Babylon, it's a, it's a health bot that is a UK-based startup company a couple of years back where, where there's a speech-controlled application where you just basically talk to the to the app, of course, and the app gives you some advice, always with some cautionary note, and you will be entitled to talk to a doctor uh, for uh, 12 hours a day on six days in the week, and so you can have health, health checks then that are being offered. And you can see the number of users, and I thought this is very interesting, because you have these users that provide the data to this network. So for uh, seven pounds or 10 pounds a month, they are entitled to this this service, and in return they give basically their data in uh, aggregated and anonymized form 
to the network, making this, uh, uh, making this system much more effective as it goes. So this is certainly something that uh, will influence diagnostics as we know it, so to speak. And um, the, 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 the term patient empowerment has been used throughout, so I was just wondering whether uh, you can probably uh, appreciate it. There are large patient networks now, like patients like me, ACOR, Cure Together, or Life Raft Group, that have hundreds of thousands of users that share their data and um, have been very influential in studies, for example, in studies lithium on, on ALS patients that were claimed to be effective, uh, were shown by these patients that not to be effective in a clinical sense and, and these types of things. So we will see certainly a complete change of, of this whole landscape. So as a conclusion, just for the few aspects that I wanted to mention is, of course, we have disruptive technologies that are respons have been responsible in the, fu in the past. These disruptive technologies will be responsible in the future. Um, medicine has been the last, uh, uh, the last field that has responded to digitalization. That is an appreciated fact. Uh, and the reasons for these are multiple, of course, and we have to catch up a little bit, but we can certainly see how this works if we look back to industry. An increase of diagnostic data volumes will be enormous, of course, and clearly, and we've seen this already, future diagnostics may be algorithms increasingly, so the question is where would be the uh, consulting, um, uh, consulting influence of the of the laboratory physician or the laboratory scientist or specialist. Patient empowerment is a consequence and not a cause of this, de of this, um, uh, of this um, development. And laboratory medicine needs to provide integrated analytics and data interpretation services in the future to do the job that we are uh, at least uh, conscious of being in, uh, uh, yeah, charged with. And with this, I thank you for your attention.